would like to give you my talk now of uh, Wagner's Ring der Nibelungen. <laughs> you know, I've been doing this routine for absolutely centuries. <laughs> Last year, I, at one concert, I thought, really, I haven't got the face to keep on doing this. So I left it out at this particular concert. And after the concert, this lady came back and absolutely in a fury, she said, well, she said, you never did your Wagner. Well, I said, I've done it so often. I mean, really, she said, well, she said, I heard it when I was a student at college, and this is my daughter, and this is my granddaughter. <laughs> and I brought them to hear you do your Wagner, and you didn't do it. <laughs> so you see, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. <laughs> so this is for the lady who's brought her granddaughter to hear it tonight for the first time. But for the rest of you who know it as well as I do, please do feel free to recite it along with me. <laughs> I know that analyses of the ring are frequently given by some great expert for the edification of other great experts. <laughs> But these are usually so esoteric as to leave the average person as befogged as before. <laughs> and I think it's inclined to discourage him from going altogether, which is a great pity because the ring is a magnificent work, supposing you can make any sense out of it. <laughs> so I would like to tell it to you as from one ordinary everyday opera goer to another. Now, the first thing you have to remember is that practically every person and event in this work has what is termed a light motif. <laughs> that I don't want you to let this make you nervous. <laughs> All it actually means is a theme song. Well, now, it comes in four parts. Das Rheingold, Die Valkyrie, Siegfried and Goethe Dameron. And it's the only grand opera on earth that comes in the giant economy package. <laughs> it's the only way. <laughs> now. <laughs> The whole thing starts with the prelude to Rheingold. The orchestra play the chord of E flat major for about six minutes. <laughs> There's not too much I need to tell you about this. If you know the chord of E flat major, you know the prelude to Rheingold. <laughs> Well, then, the scene opens in the River Rhine. In it. <laughs> and swimming around there, you, you have the three Rhine maidens, or Nixes. They are a sort of an aquatic Andrew sister. <laughs> and they sing their theme, which is as follows. Fire, 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 I won't translate it because it doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> well, these Rhine maidens are looking after a lump of magic gold. And the magic of this gold consists of the fact that anybody who will renounce love and make a ring out of this gold can become master of the universe. This is the gimmick. <laughs> now, up from underneath the Rhine, all of a sudden, there comes a little dwarf called Alberic. Here he is. Got the glad to glitter glimmer, big like a sauce. Mit Hannen und Fussen, ich fasse noch Hände, der schlägt und das Schlupf ab. Feucht ein Nass, bin wie die Nase. Well, as you can plainly see, he's exceedingly unattractive. <laughs> And he makes a pass at the Rhine Maidens, who think he's perfectly ghastly. 
So the Rhine maidens tell him. So Albrecht thinks, well. He thinks, I'm obviously not going to get any love here, so I may as well renounce it and take this magic gold and make this ring and become master of the universe. So he steals the gold and he takes it down under the Rhine with him. And here he is making this ring. unionized yet <laughs> but he makes the ring and here is the theme of the ring I'd like you to remember that because you'll be amazed where this ring is going to get to <laughs> before we're through with all this business well there's Albrecht down there with the ring and the Rhine maidens are swimming around at sea level and up here you see this is a vertical story <laughs> up here you get Wotan the head god and the perfectly crashing boar <laughs> well he and his wife Mrs. Frika Wotan <laughs> That's her name. <laughs> Are having a castle built for them called Valhalla. It's been built by a couple of giants called Fasolt and Fafna. Well, naturally, these giants wish to be paid for building this edifice, and what they wish to be rewarded with is Freya. Well, now, Freya is Wotan's sister-in-law and a perfectly beautiful girl. She's currently looking after the Valhalla branch of Elizabeth Arden. <laughs> well, when the giants take her away, of course, there's no, no beauty parlour, and Mrs. Boatown starts to look terribly scruffy. <laughs> and she's a frightful nag, so she nags and nags at Boatown to get her back again, which she does. Well, then the only other thing the giants will settle for for building Valhalla is this magic ring that Albrecht has just made. So Wotan goes from Valhalla down to where Alberic is and cons him out of this ring. Well, naturally, Alberic is simply furious. <laughs> and he puts a terrible curse on the ring. curse, isn't it? <laughs> That's the one. But Botan takes no notice. He takes the ring right back up to Valhalla and gives it to Fasolt. Well, directly, Fafna kills Fasolt to get this ring for himself. <laughs> so Botan knows that this curse is working. 
man and it worries him. So he goes down to earth level to talk to a fortune teller he knows called my friend Erda. <laughs> she is a green-faced torso that pops out of the ground. At least we used to think she was a torso because this is as far as she ever came out. <laughs> But in the telecast from Bayreuth, she came right out. She, just, <laughs> she does have some legs. She's wrapped up in a dirty old dust sheet. <laughs> but anyway, up to this point, this is as far as she came. And she says to Votan, Feike Votan, Feike, which means be careful, Votan. Be careful. She then proceeds to bear him eight daughters. <laughs> so she should have been careful. <laughs> well, these uh, these daughters are the Valkyries, headed by Brunhilda, and they are the noisiest women. Libretto that they all are all of them virgins. And I'm not the least bit surprised. <laughs> well, recently somebody said, you know, you're wrong there. There were nine Valkyries, and actually there were, but you see, Brunhilda came slightly differently from the other lot. She sprang fully accoutred in chain mail and winged helmet out of Votan's head. <laughs> and that, of course, is parthenogenesis and another story entirely. <laughs> well, that is the end of part one. Well, in part two, you find Votan wandering around on the earth, and he has two illegitimate children, Siegmund and Sieglinda, by a mortal. Why, is, oh, he's very versatile. <laughs> well, he has these children whilst disguised under the singularly appropriate name of Wolf. <laughs> well, these children get separated when young, and see Glinda marries rather a disagreeable fellow called Hunding, who plays the French horn. <laughs> to this occupation, he has an ash tree with a sword stuck in it, growing through his living room floor. <laughs> He's terribly house and garden. <laughs> well, one day who should come along but Siegmund? And he falls madly in love with Sieglinda, regardless of the fact that she's married to Hunding, which is immoral, and she's his own sister, which is illegal. <laughs> but that, of course, is the great beauty of grand opera. You can do anything. <laughs> so long as you sing it. <laughs> And after having given the hunding a Mickey Finn, so they won't wake him up, they certainly do sing it. 
Wintersturm erwischenden Vordermann in mildem Lichter leuchtet der Lens. You are my spring that I have so long for in frosty winter's cold. Well, when they get a lot of that off their chests, Siegmund pulls out the sword that's stuck in the tree that grows in the house that Jack built, <laughs> like the hunting built, and uh, they, then they run away together. Well, of course, when Hunding comes to, he's frightfully annoyed and he chases after them and there's a tremendous battle in which everybody seems to become involved. <laughs> Siegmund. Mr. and Mrs. Botan get in a most frantic argument, the outcome of which is that Botan gets mad at Brunhilda. You see, <laughs> you see, Mrs. Botan, who's a prude as well as a nag, well, Mrs. Botan told Botan to tell Brunhilda she was not to side with Siegmund and she did. <laughs> ah, but the reason she did was that Sieglinda is going to have Siegmund's child. Don't know how she knew they only met last night. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what she said, so... <laughs> so as a punishment, Wotan puts Brunhilda on a rock. Although, how Sieglinda, having Siegmund's child, can possibly be Brunhilda's fault? <laughs> Only Richard Wagner could tell us. <laughs> well, anyway, he puts Brunhilda on a rock, then he nags her into a coma. <laughs> He surrounds the rock with impenetrable fire. And that's the end of part two. <laughs> well, part three is devoted to the growing up of Siegfried, this child. So you see, sure enough. <laughs> and he's very young and he's very strong and he's very brave and he's very handsome and he's very strong. Stupid. <laughs> He's a regular little Abner type. <laughs> and there's not too much you need to know about this part except that Siegfried gets the ring by killing Fafner. Do you remember Fafner? <laughs> Do you remember he built Valhalla? A giant? <laughs> Well, he's a dragon now. Don't ask me why. <laughs> but anyway, he's dead. And Siegfried has the ring. Then a little bird comes. And this little bird tells Siegfried, who understands him, <laughs> He understands him because Siegfried has accidentally tasted a drop of Fafner's blood. <laughs> we won't go into it or we will be into Dracula. Well, never mind. This little bird tells Siegfried that. And he tells Siegfried about Brunhilda on that this fire surrounded rock. So Siegfried goes and he somehow gets through this impenetrable fire and sees Brunhilda lying there and makes the classic understatement of all time. He says, this is no man. <laughs> I mean, have you seen the average?
average Brunhilda. <laughs> but you know, it isn't as stupid as it sounds because he's never seen a woman in his life, so he, he doesn't know what she is. But he jolly soon finds out. <laughs> and then they go in for some very competitive singing. Anything you can sing, I can sing louder. She wins. <laughs> then they fall passionately in love, and guess what Siegfried gives Brunhilda? That's right, the ring. They don't know each other that well yet. <laughs> Oh, by the way, she's his aunt. <laughs> but never mind, everybody's happy, so you'd think, wouldn't you, that that would be the end of the whole thing. You'd think. <laughs> Part four. Goethe Damerung. Well, in the beginning of Goethe Damerung, you get the three norns, or fates, and they are also daughters of my friend Erda, the green-faced torso, <laughs> and by the same token, also Siegfried's aunts. But this bunch of aunts are just as dismal as the Valkyrie aunts were noisy. You remember the Valkyrie aunts, don't you? Quiet a hole, well, this lot are just the opposite. Well, if this dismal lot, lot of odds don't go and retell this entire story <laughs> right over again from the beginning. <laughs> That is, of course, in case you couldn't hear it the first time. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you could miss out parts one, two, and three and go in at the beginning of Goethe Damerung, and you'd be just about as far ahead as anyone else is. <laughs> well, meanwhile, Siegfried is fed up with Love on the Rocks with Brunhilde. <laughs> And Brunhilde's gone completely to pieces because, if you'll remember, she was the head girl of the quiet a whole lot. Well, now she's changed to a girl like this. has certainly taken the ginger out of her. <laughs> well then, Siegfried goes off on his travels once more and he meets three people, the family Gibichung. There is Guntan Gutrune Gibich <laughs> and their half-brother Hagen, whose mother was a Gibich. <laughs> but whose father, whose father, was Albrecht the Dwarf. <laughs> Do you remember Albrecht? <laughs> well, Hagen greets Siegfried like this. I, Siegfried, Teurer Held. Now, do you recognize that tune of Hagen's greeting? Anyone? <laughs> well, it's the same music as Albrecht's curse. And sure enough, there's dirty work afoot. <laughs> because Hagen gives Siegfried a magic potion which makes him forget all about Brunhilda and fall in love with Gutrune Gibich. <laughs> who, by the way, is the only woman that Siegfried has ever met in his entire life who wasn't his aunt. <laughs> this up. <laughs>
Well, when Brunhilde discovers what's going on, she's frightfully annoyed, and she conspires with Hagen that he shall kill Siegfried for revenge, which he does. Well, of course, as soon as Siegfried's dead, Brunhilde's sorry. So, <coughs> excuse me, they build a funeral pyre, and they put Siegfried on it. Then Brunhilde goes and gets on her horse. She's got a horse. <laughs> and they gallop onto the funeral pyre too. So now you have Siegfried, Brunhilde, and the horse. And they light it and that bunch burn up. That says fire to Valhalla and it burns up. Wotan and all the gods are inside, so they burn up. And that sets the whole thing on fire, so everything burns up. The whole works is burnt. Well, then. <laughs> the River Rhine, which possibly some of you may still recall, <laughs> Well, the river Rhine rises and the water's coming over all this burnt stuff and who do you suppose turns up next? This one'll kill you. <laughs> the Rhine maidens. <laughs> so they go scrabbling around in all these ashes and they find the ring, which is, of course, their original magic gold, and they put it back on the rock in the Rhine where it came from so after sitting through this whole long involved rigmarole for four entire evenings at those prices <laughs> all of a sudden what do you hear la 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 you're exactly where you came in 20 hours ago. And you know, recently I had a most horrible thought. You see, there is the ring, which is the original magic gold, back on the rock in the Rhine, where it came from, as I just said. Here are the Rhine maidens swimming around in the Rhine. And somewhere down there under the Rhine is Alberic. <laughs> Do you know they could start this whole damn thing all over again? 